my guess is, particularly when you're thinking about about uh, you know November, which is when these counts were done, if you're taking the commuter rail on the weekend in November, when we had those cold temperatures and we had um, COVID starting to spike, you were probably someone who was an essential worker or someone who really had no other way um, to go and take care of an elderly relative or something else. And so, you know, we really have to push back and be careful with this idea that low ridership equals low importance. All right, well, welcome to our, how will our public transportation system recover after the pandemic? That's the topic of our Todd talk this morning, as we like to call them, our transit oriented development talk sponsored by Mass Inc. Gateway Cities Innovation Institute and the GBH Forum Network. Welcome to you all. Uh, as we usually begin, we begin with a moment of silence. And this morning it is to remember the victims of COVID-19. The national total now more than 500,000. Of course, the pandemic so uh, has affected so much of our lives, especially in the area of transportation. But let's just take a moment of silence to remember those we've lost. Well, first, I'd like to introduce our uh, guest this morning. And uh, I should mention that Tracy Corley, who initiated this series uh, more than a year ago, and we've done several fascinating programs with Tracy, has left Mass Inc. and is now working for the Conservation Law Foundation. And uh, so our, our uh, new co-host is Andre LaRue, uh, who is a consultant currently leading Mass Inc.'s transformative transit-oriented development program at the Gateway Cities Innovation Institute, is a native of Worcester, he has extensive experience living and working in our older industrial cities here in Massachusetts. He led the Massachusetts Smart Growth Alliance for 12 years, where he championed zoning reform and other policies supporting walkable, affordable, vibrant, and diverse communities. He also serves on the board of Smart Growth America and chairs the planning board for the city of Medford. We also welcome Jared Johnson, the Executive Director of Transit Matters, an organization dedicated to improving transit in and around Boston. Previously, he served as a project manager for the Codman Square Neighborhood Development Corporation, where he managed a variety of complex affordable housing projects and supported or organizing efforts for the better service on the Fairmont line. And we welcome from afar, Veronica Vanterpool, She's the Chief Innovative Officer at the Delaware Transit Corporation. She has had 15 years of transportation leadership experience in the New York metro region, where she advocated for equity and sustainability in transportation. And Veronica is the former Deputy Director of the National Vision Zero Network and has served on the board of the New York Metropolitan Transportation Authority as a voting member. And uh, we welcome Veronica as we do uh, many of these programs. We invite people from outside the Boston, Massachusetts area to give us a uh, national perspective. And last but certainly not least, we welcome Mayor Tom McGee, Mayor of Lynn, Massachusetts. Previously, he served as a Massachusetts State Senator for the Third Essex District from 2002 to 2017, former chairman of the Senate Transportation Committee. He has a wealth of knowledge and interest in transportation issues here in Massachusetts and is certainly not reluctant to share his opinions. So we welcome Mayor McGee this morning. We're going to begin with, uh, we we'll have three poll questions. We're going to begin with one of them this morning. Uh, we'd like to get a sense of where our audience is coming from. So we're asking you before the pandemic, what was your main mode of mobility? How did you commute or get around? And you'll see the options there, car, bus, subway, train, bike, or walk. Give us an idea of what your main mode of mobility was before the pandemic. And now to uh, begin our discussion, I'd like to uh, open with our new co-host, Andre, to uh, get his thoughts about the topic we're talking about this morning, and also what he is expecting to hear and learn from our guests on our panel. Andre. Great, thank you for the welcome, Bob. I'm gonna to try to fill Tracy's shoes. Uh, she has a great uh, new opportunity with the Conservation Law Foundation, so I'm excited for, for her. And I'm really thrilled to have uh, the, the panelists uh, with us today. I've been able to, to work with all of them in, uh, in some form over the last uh, few years. And I know we're gonna have a great conversation. So 
I have so many questions, obviously, about what's going on with the transportation system. Obviously, there's been a lot of changes. There's a lot of tension around it. And I think that there's, uh, you know, there's the cliche of in crisis, there's opportunity, which everybody uses a little too much. But um, rather than start with fear, let's start with hope. And I want to ask a question of, of our guests. What is the, uh, you know, what is the greatest opportunity that you see? Has there been anything positive uh, for the transportation system as a result of this crisis? And, and how do you think we can capitalize on that? Maybe let's start with, uh, let me start with Jared. Sure. Yeah, I think one of the one of the things that's been positive is there's been a shift away from the traditional rush hour. Um, and, you know, obviously COVID has, you know, accelerated that with a lot of folks working from home. And we think that even after the pandemic is over, that there's going to be a sizable amount of folks, uh, if not working from home, certainly coming in a little bit later, um, you know, working a little bit later, having more flexible hours. Uh, and so, you know, the, the bus network has been, you know, they've sort of, they've flattened out the, what we, you know, they flattened out another curve. They flattened out the fact that, you know, they put in a ton of buses and trains, you know, into service between seven and nine. Um, well, you know, obviously the numbers are a lot lower overall, but they're seeing that, that the new rush hour um, is a lot longer. It's, it's shifted earlier and it's a little bit longer. And so I think that's going to continue. And actually the, uh, the commuter rail network is going to make a really big shift in the spring. Uh, and so they're actually going to, 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 uh, to have, um, you know, as low as uh, headways or the time between trains as low as 30 minutes uh, out by uh, Mayor McGee and 45 minutes uh, in Dorchester and pretty much across the, the network, it's going to get um, hourly or pretty close to hourly. So I think, um, you know, that's a really positive development. And I hope that that continues, you know, again, the shift away from just serving rush hour, which leaves behind, um, you know, leaves behind working families and working parents um, and leaves behind, you know, our third shift workers and, and, and other folks who have non-traditional work hours. So I think that's a really positive development. Right. Uh, Mayor McGee, let's go to you next, and then we'll we'll uh, see what's happening in other parts of the country with Veronica after you. Thank you. Great to be here this morning. Uh, so I, I really believe that uh, when when as this pandemic moves uh, moves through and we we uh, move out of this pandemic, that there's going to be a major return to uh, transit and and the the vision and the planning we've done over the years, uh, the continued uh, economic uh, development that's been happening. Uh, Seeing it in my city on the North Shore, we have we're looking at uh, uh, close to eight or nine hundred new units. Some that'll be uh, completely occupied by this spring, uh, right right either next to or within a less than five minute walk to the uh, train station in Lynn. I think uh, you, I really believe that we're going to be seeing a rebirth of people getting out and about, wanting to be out, seeing people, and transit is the way to go. And and I'm really excited about the uh, not only the opportunity but the vision and the planning that's gone on particularly on the commuter rail with the, the regional rail and, you know, creating a rapid transit system on that uh, system uh, with uh, the transportation bond that was recently passed. Uh, there's $200 million in it to actually elect, help electrification and uh, the revisioning of the commuter rail system on the North Shore uh, down to uh, uh, Mattapan on the South Shore, as well as uh, the Rhode Island uh, electrification. So there's really an opportunity here to take advantage of the planning and vision and, and, uh, take advantage of the investment that's happening to create additional housing in the region. And transit is the key for our, for today and for tomorrow. Thank you. And Veronica, what are you seeing in Delaware and other parts of the country? Good morning, everyone. This new opportunity arising from the pandemic really allows us to align service with the demands of our core ridership base. So what does that mean in, in plain speak English? It means that we are looking at those riders that are most dependent on our service and saying, can we provide service earlier? Can we provide more service hours on the weekends in a way that we didn't have the clarity to do before because we were serving a much larger customer base, including choice riders, as Jared mentioned earlier in his comments. Uh, cities such as Wilmington, where I am based, we would receive a lot of commuters coming in from uh, cities such as Philadelphia, and with the change in work from home and remote working and teleworking, the city of Wilmington is not seeing as many of those riders come in on SEPTA anymore. So we have been looking with greater um, uh, 
discretion at the kind of bus service that we provide and, and wanting to better tailor that for our core ridership base, particularly in the city of Wilmington, which has the highest transit ridership throughout the entire state of Delaware. Okay, hey, um, thank you, Andre and Veronica. And I would like to ask you, Veronica, one of the most contentious issues here in Boston now is the plan of the MBTA to cut back service and reduce service on buses, subways. Interesting how they're altering commuter rail, maybe for the better, but is this something that's happening across the country? Are transit agencies pulling back on service because of the reduced ridership and revenue? Absolutely. We're seeing that this is not a unique situation in Massachusetts, of course. Um, using an analogous example from New York, uh, tying a little bit um, into my, my former board membership of, of the MTA, I noticed that the MTA has reduced service significantly, particularly on its commuter rail. Uh, but the population and demographic that the commuter rail system in the New York Metro serves is very different than how it's serving uh, Massachusetts in particular. Uh, so we are seeing significant service declines, even in Delaware. At the same time, we've been adding some service hours. We've actually had to make some service adjustments. But again, uh, we've been looking at how to do that with our core ridership. But we're seeing transit agencies making very, very difficult decisions. And in fact, um, relying so heavily on the federal government to provide operating support, which traditionally the federal government does not do, uh, for, particularly for cities that are large. And we have been beneficiaries of that shift in, in policy, and we expect to receive another uh, infusion of funds uh, for all the transit agencies. And that has been tremendously helpful for agencies such as New York MTA to stave off significant service cuts and even fare increases uh, in a way that many other uh, transit agencies may not be able to do. I think it's particularly notable that the MTA actually has such a diversified funding portfolio that has actually worked very much in its favor at this point because there had been some increased revenue uh, from a variety of some of the taxes, internet uh, sales tax, for example, and the payroll mobility tax. And systems that have the most diversified funding sources have been faring a little bit better. And that is one reason why the MTA, with the infusion of federal operating support over a few different um, uh, acts and, and support packages from Congress, has been able to, I think, make a decision that many other agencies have not been able to do. So well, it's uh, puts the agency in a very unique situation. Yeah, and uh, of course, uh, that's a big issue here in Boston as well. With uh, Now, Jared, I know you want to jump in. We, we have the results of our first poll question. Can we see that now? Okay, so most of you before the pandemic were in your cars, 44%. The next uh, highest was subway, 24%. And we had 10% uh, of you walking, 9% of you biking, 7% on the train, and 6% on the bus. So still uh, close to half of you uh, were taking your car. Okay, Jared, uh, you wanted to jump in and make a comment. Go right ahead. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to dovetail off of what uh, Veronica was saying about really focusing on the core ridership. And I think that's really key. And I think that's that's hopefully the future. And that's how transit agencies, I think, are going to have to really put their energies towards, um, you know, because when you look at who is riding transit now and who's going to you know, who's likely to be the first ones to come back, it's going to be that that core ridership. Um, and so I really think there needs to be a strategy of what I call sort of lifting from the bottom. Um, and so that is, like I said, focusing on those essential workers, focusing on, uh, you know, our low income and working class folks that are using transit, you know, today. Um, and, you know, that doesn't mean forget about the suburbs, obviously, that, you know, we've got, uh, you know, this sort of, you know, suburbanization of the poor happening where a lot of folks are getting pushed out. Uh, because of displacement and gentrification. So we've got to make sure that that's, you know, it's not a call for that. But I think what it is a shift or what it is a call to do um, is to focus on those hours in between rush hour, uh, to focus on late night and super early morning service. And then I think it's about, um, you know, figuring out how do we market, how do we get those, you know, for lack of a better term, and it's an industry term that that folks use that I don't always love, but, you know, as Veronica was saying, that choice riders, let's, let's figure out how do we market to get them onto the service that is really being utilized, um, you know, um, and and how do we get them to to go to the services that we're that we're putting on the the um, you know on the roads and on the rails 
um, you know, for working class and low income folks, how do we get them onto that service instead of the other way around? Because, you know, we saw what happened, you know, with particularly, you know, commuter rail. Commuter rail is one of the biggest examples of that where ridership dropped 98% uh, and is still hovering around 88%. And, you know, I think the future of that, as Mayor McGee is talking about, is really shifting that model to be less, you know, less so, less so, you know, exclusively focused on nine to five, um, you know, nine to five downtown commuters, but, you know, focus on nine to five downtown commuters and focus on local, local trips that people are taking from Lynn to Chelsea, or people are taking to their doctor's appointments, you know, within Dorchester, um, and, you know, making it work for, um, and that makes it work for everybody, including those, those office workers, you know, for working parents and those sandwich generation that needs to have, um, you know, the availability to, to be able to get back to their community in case of an emergency. Well, it's interesting to note that the, the mode of transit, which has taken the biggest hit, and that is commuter rail, really, and I'm turning to you, Mayor McGee, really offers the most opportunity for change and transformation. And you have quite a vision about what can be done. Tell us about it. Well, that's a great point. Uh, commuter rail, it, you know, the subway system is great, uh, transit. Uh, we're not going to be building a, a, a major expansion of that. We just don't have the capacity in terms of density in the region. But we have a major system, the commuter rail system, that's been underutilized, in my opinion. And I think that's where the vision for regional rail is key. Electrification, running it more like a rapid transit subway system. I know Mass Inc. several years ago put out a report uh, with all of the gateway cities included, talking about how the, the commuter rail connections through those gateway cities, Lynn, uh, Lawrence, Haverhill, uh, you know, throughout the region, uh, Lowell, that you can really utilize that commuter rail system as a rapid transit system and make those connections, make it affordable, dependable, and and uh, frequent. And and so, uh, you know, two points. One, I think stepping back and making cuts at this point, particularly with federal dollars coming in is a mistake, because I do think that you'll be seeing a rebound, particularly with those that need to take advantage of of transit, uh, but more importantly, I think we can't lose sight of what we need to do today. And and in a short shorter term, not longer term, start to create the access points through the commuter rail line uh, and make it rapid transit. You know, if you could get on, if you can get on the rapid uh, the commuter rail in Lynn, which is not effective, affordable, or efficient for for Lynn, but run it as a rapid transit system in along that corridor, you, you'll be transforming the commuter rail system as well as creating the uh, transit oriented development that would, would blossom off of that. You're seeing it happen already without the, the service in Lynn, Beverly, Salem, on the south, down even to Plymouth. You know, when you're talking about even on the outer core as well as the gateway cities in Brockton and, and in, in Lawrence along that corridor. So I, I think uh, we need to uh, not, not scale back and be uncomfortable or, or worried about the kind of investment and vision, but we really need to step up. There's been a lot of planning that's gone on and the Fiscal Management Control Board has embraced the first phase of of really reimagining the regional, a regional rail, or really a rapid transit rail. And I'll just leave you with this. I, I was in Tokyo several years ago. The thing that amazed me, I was on a high speed rail. It's amazing uh, how fast that goes, getting you around the country. But what really hit me was the commuter rail and the transit oriented development. And it was really like a 65, 70 mile an hour subway cars connecting people through the Tokyo, greater Tokyo region on a commuter rail system that really looked like a subway system, but was efficient, um, effective, and uh, affordable, and, and uh, people could depend on it. So that the opportunity is here. We need to take advantage of that. And it seems like Keolis is being cooperative in trying to make it happen. So that's encouraging as well. Uh, let's put up our second poll question. Uh, we'd like to know if your main mode of mobility or, or how you commuted to work, how did it change during the pandemic? And you'll see the choices from drastically changed to unsure. Uh, maybe you were just ended up staying at home. We don't know, but let's let's find out. Give us give us your thoughts. Um, you know, the, the I mentioned the most controversial issue facing the the T right now is this cutback in service, which is going to apparently begin on March 14th. And I'm just going to play devil's advocate here to say that the governor has said. Uh, it doesn't make sense to spend money running empty subways, buses, and trains. I'd like to get your reaction to that. I'm not sure who would like to jump in first. Maybe, uh, Mayor, you'd like to comment, and then we can go to Jared. 
Could you just repeat that? I'm sorry. I, yes. I... Uh, you know, Governor Baker said it doesn't make sense to spend money running empty trains. So uh, let's let's take a look at what the problem is from my perspective. You 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 scale back the uh, the system. You you make cuts, and then it takes months to recreate those those services. Or are they going to be coming back? And and so it leaves uh, those that are depending on those systems, particularly when they're ready to go back to work. Essential work is uh, people that are on the lower end of the economic scale that that depend on these systems. Uh, will they have a chance to get back on? And then self-defeating, you know, because what happens is there's less ridership, and and so you you keep looking at those cuts. I think we we should make sure that the service is available. The federal government is has uh, giving us uh, substantial money. Anticipate more money coming back through the and I, it looks like it will pass the 1.9 trillion dollar uh, President Biden proposal, which will send dollars back to uh, uh, transit systems, as well as a whole slew of uh, um, investment back in, in our economy. Uh, I think it's short-sighted to, to move back. I think we really need to be prepared for people to take advantage of uh, as we move out of this. Uh, and again, as of yesterday, the governor is talking about um, lifting restrictions. How are people gonna get around? People that depend on transit and buses and the commuter rail need to be able to get back on those systems. Uh, and I'll just leave with this, uh, you know, the, the, the developments going on around uh, in the downtown Lynn, uh, you know, 251 units, 67 car spots across the way, 330 units, uh, similar amount of car locations. People are moving uh, to these places. Uh, two more developments happening, ready to break ground. Uh, that's indicative of what's going on in the region. People are uh, getting into the transit oriented development uh, housing options and they need access for many reasons around the region. And, and I just think it's so short-sighted and, and challenging to scale back, cut the service. And then we've been told it's gonna to be months before you can bring some of that service back. And, it, and again, it, we hate to see a self-fulfilling prof prophecy that, well, it doesn't work and we're not gonna invest in it. So I, I think we need to keep, I think we need to be ready for, uh, for what's happening over the next two or three months as people get back to, to uh, a more normal world. Well, you know, Jared, one of the things the MBTA says it's doing is saving money so it can make sure it has the money to sustain the service as we move forward. What about that argument? You know, I mean, I, it, it sounds good on its face, but one of the things you have to be careful about, you know, and this is exactly the point that um, Mayor McGee is making, is that service availability stimulates demand, right? That, that you know, for a lot of, of um, uh, for a lot of transit uh, riders, transit users that that have a vehicle or have another option, um, and almost a, a sizable amount of them have um, access to TNCs or you know Uber and Lyft. Um, if they if they don't think the train is going to be there, if they think that they might have to wait too long for the bus or that the bus is going to be too crowded in this sort of phase where we're recovering from COVID, but we're not all the way there yet, they're going to take another service. And so then, you know, you get exactly what Mayor McGee is talking about with that death spiral. And then another really important point is that low ridership doesn't equal low importance. You know, and transit advocates have, have said, yes, we think the T should have flexibility. You know, we don't, if there is truly a line, um, you know, or a route that, that that is really, really low ridership, let's, let's look at curtailing that. But what we've been really firm against is we don't like the idea of just cutting out a service, including, for example, on weekend, you know, to, to keep picking on commuter rail, um, you know, they, the T has shut down weekend service on a, on a lot of lines. Um, and, you know, my guess is, particularly when you're thinking about, about, uh, you know, November, which is when these counts were done, if you're taking the commuter rail on the weekend in November, when we had those cold temperatures and we had um, COVID starting to spike, you were probably someone who was an essential worker or someone who really had no other way um, to go and take care of an elderly relative or something else. And so, you know, we really have to push back and be careful with this idea that low ridership equals low importance. You know, if, if that's a really good point, Jared. At yeah. one of the recent public hearings, there were a lot of Brandeis researchers, and one of them said, you know, we have to go in and see our lab mice on the weekends. Right. <laughs> with no commuter rail service on the Fitchburg line, there's no way we can do it. So uh, it's a really good point. Yeah. Uh, okay, we have the results of our second poll. Um, 49, about 50% of you said, yes, your main mode of transportation or how you commuted has drastically changed. 26% slightly changed. 25% of you said completely unchanged. And, and no one was unsure. So all of you were sure of that. Veronica, you wanted to say a quick word. Uh, thanks, Bob. 
I, I, while operating expenses are obviously an important consideration, I would caution against overemphasizing the value of operating expenses because in the transit sector, we're never going to find value that way. Transit is a public good. And if we start relying on operating expense as a key criteria to keep service running or not, we're always going to be behind. We, uh, most transit agencies don't charge uh, a fare that actually mirrors what the actual cost of operating that service is. Even pre-pandemic, just look at our buses. Um, the cost of generally operating a bus can be three, two to three times more what the actual fare is. And it should be that way. Transit should continue to be heavily subsidized. So we ensure that it remains a public good. So I think in keeping at the forefront that this is a public good and a service that's essential um, and not necessarily looking at operating expenses, I think is an important uh, cost benefit analysis. All right, very good. Um, let, I, let me just jump in and say um, a, a big question that I, that I have. I see two trends really when thinking about the transportation nowadays. One is that there's, uh, you know, Jared, like your organization has articulated a, a true transformation of the commuter rail system in, in greater Boston. So it's this, uh, you know, electrifying it, more service, fair affairs, and uh, really a, a, a big transformation of, of the system. And then there's this other trend that I see, which is to kind of go small, right? How do we, how do, we do that last mile? Can we maybe, maybe we should turn away from big capital projects and try to find out if we can do more kind of on-demand service or small scale mobility. So how do we balance the, those, co can we do one or the other? Do we have to, can we do hmm. both? How do you see that playing out going forward? And maybe we do both. Oh, but yeah, go, go ahead, Mayor. We give it. We oh, no. to... Jared, it's fine. Yeah, no, we 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 we've got to do both, right? I mean, the you know, Joelle, chairman of the of the T's board, said something really, just just really precinct, and this was well before COVID. He said commuter rail carries too few people for too for too much money, uh, and so even though you think, even though you you see that that. Um, you know that that service packed during rush hour the rails are empty during the middle of the day and so we we do have to make those transformative things those transformative projects happen because as mayor mcgee has said you know there are there are transit deserts and there are highways well over capacity and you know there's 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 enough there's probably enough demand in some of these places where you know maybe in an ideal world you could wave a magic wand and and you could do uh, subway expansion or something really, really expensive, uh, and so we think that even as ex even as as expensive as um, commuter rail transformation is, it's actually a bargain um, compared to to really the amount of money that you would need to do if, if you didn't have that asset there. So we think of of transformation as actually sort of a a, a more cost effective way of getting more value out of that, and then on top of that we need to do uh, some of the things that you're talking about, those smaller scale, first mile, last mile uh, things. And that's that's on-demand services. That's looking at how do we utilize our, our RTAs uh, that are at the ends of some of our commuter rail lines and how do we resource them so that they can not only provide the service that they're providing today, um, but also expand and, and, and embrace new technologies and, and, and be a part of that first mile, last mile. I'm glad you mentioned RTAs, Jared. We've had a couple of questions from our audience members about RTAs, and I'm going to put a plug in for a story I'll be running on Monday about how RTAs are adopting um, on-demand apps that people can use to get that first mile, last mile service on demand same day as opposed to their fixed route service. And it's proving to be very successful. So uh, any of the questions that our audience has, please feel free to uh, enter Q&A and uh, let us know what you're thinking. Um, did uh, Mayor McGee, did you wanna to respond to what Andre was saying? Sure, sure. I, I, Jared laid it out pretty well, but I think all of the above, I think all of the pieces in the puzzle uh, create a really robust um, opportunity for you know, future 21st century trans transportation system. You know, it's, it's the last mile connections, it's reimagining the commuter rail line into a much more uh, affordable and, and uh, frequent service throughout the region. And I've said this, uh, you know, if we looked at Massachusetts and we really wanted to invest like Toronto was investing, which if you laid Toronto on east of Massachusetts, it would come from southern New Hampshire to northern Rhode Island. They're creating a, a, a robust, integrated regional rail system, uh, transit buses that really create uh, a future for, the, for, for, the, for Toronto and, and the people that live there. 
Uh, so I think it's all of those pieces. And uh, in terms of uh, the interconnection between regional transit and the MBTA, which Davey used to say uh, when he was uh, secretary uh, and as a head of the GM of the T, that the MBTA was uh, just another piece of the regional uh, transit system in the state. So if you start to integrate these regional transit authorities and make those the connections to a broader, more robust system, you make those connections throughout the Commonwealth and you make uh, you, you allow access to places that people are leaving because they can't get to jobs but would like to live there with, with uh, schools losing uh, population, people leaving communities. You add a transit system that connects uh, with regional transit and as well as throughout the state, you'll see a different and a greater opportunity for economic growth and quality of life for our future. We can make that happen if we are willing to make the investment and see it through together. You know, one of our questioners was asking, you know, how can we be sure that there's going to be uh, this change in rush hour uh, traffic? And, and uh, as he said, I would question the magnitude of the shift away from peak travel. I would just say that, you know, because of what's happened with the pandemic, you know, people are not having to commute into the city of Boston every day. And even if they're being asked to as their business reopens, there's probably going to be a great number of them who will choose not to, if they have the ability, drive or commute into the city at least every day. And that's really going to change uh, what's happening both on our roadways and, and mass transit. So um, one of the things that I, 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 the current chair of the Senate Transportation Committee, Joseph Boncori, has released this new deal for transportation, which is quite striking and sweeping where he's proposing fare free buses across the state, both RTAs and on the MBTA. And he's, he's proposing a lot of uh, ways of really opening up accessibility to transit uh, so that people who cannot afford it or cannot get to it will be able to use it. Uh, I'd like to get your, intro, you know, your reaction, if you're familiar with that proposal uh, w about what he's thinking about. Mayor McGee, he's he's the current transportation Senate chairman. What do you think about his, uh, his proposal? So Joe's a great guy. I served with him on the committee. He was vice chair when I was chairman. So uh, uh, Joe Joe has a good a, a great vision as well. I think I think taking a look at how we can get and I think Veronica laid it out. It's not about the return. It's about what is the value that you bring when you make these kind of investments. So I think uh, I'd be, I haven't seen it, Joe's plan. I'd, I'd love to see. Uh, what it looks like, uh, but I, I think as I was talking about earlier, we're a, we're a smaller state, and with East West Rail talked about in the corridor that uh, Congressman Neal created from Greenfield down to uh, to Springfield, uh, we have the pieces available. So I think working together, we can and making it available, affordable, and 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 reliable will change people's uh, ability to uh, to do to do these kind of things. And uh, you know, I have 23 year old twins. Uh, my daughter has a job. She's remote. She would not be. She'd be working in Boston if she was, uh, if the, there wasn't a pandemic. They're ready to move and and go out and 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 be out in the world. And I think a lot of people feel that way. It may not be, uh, you know, everybody seven to nine in the morning and you know five to seven at night. People want to be out and people want access to the world. They want connections with people. And I think whether it be buses, uh, uh, but a robust system and making those options available, that is affordable for people. You will see. Uh, a transformation, in my opinion, in, in terms of how people live, work, travel, and move throughout the state. So uh, I, I think it's a great, I think it's a great thing to explore uh, any kind of options as as the chairman is talking about. Well, Ver uh, Veronica, can ahead. I just ask if, uh, you know, in your area, I know you were going to say something, but th this whole idea of free fit bus fares, how viable is that? Is that, is this the wave of the future? Thank you for, for asking that question, Andre, because I was going to say, while I'm unfamiliar with the, the chairman's proposal, I have a very perhaps provocative approach to um, free fares on transit systems. And this actually was cultivated during my time as a transit advocate. Even though I work in a transit agency now, I felt this way when I was in the advocacy community, much like Jared is in Massachusetts. I am not a proponent of free fares. And the reason is because I always want our transit service to be improved. And I think uh, taking away a, um, a source of revenue, even if that source of revenue is 
somewhat negligible for some of our transit systems. Um, some transit systems don't receive uh, a lot in revenue. Their fare box recovery is not significant. So they're not generating tremendous revenue from the fare box. Nevertheless, I think it's important to take that money and reinvest it into improved and better and expanded and enhanced service. And for those individuals for whom um, transit affordability remains a top priority and consideration, I think municipalities and or systems and agencies need to work together to ensure that those uh, riders have fares that are affordable. So just to draw on a parallel example from New York City, uh, there was a fair fares campaign, which actually allowed those who are eligible for a, a reduced uh, price metro card, a fare card, uh, were able to ride the system for uh, a reduced fare. And I was very supportive of rolling that out um, for those individuals, again, who have no or limited means. So I think we need to ensure that we have fair programs that support those individuals that are financially uh, challenged, but not but ensure that transit agencies still have various revenue sources to reinvest back into the system. Thanks for that. Um, yeah. And and I do know that, you know, the MBTA was not charging on its buses for a while when the shutdown first began. I know there are some RTAs, including in Worcester, who are still not charging bus fares. Um, there's been a little criticism of that. But on the other hand, they feel they have so many, there's so few riders who depend on them the most that uh, they're providing that. Uh, we had a question, uh, well, we have a third poll question. Why don't we get that out before we forget? Uh, do you expect to resume your commuting and traveling habits to what they were pre-pandemic? And that's simply yes, no, or unsure. So let us know. Um, this is a, a question uh, from one of our participants. Is it possible to require developers who build next to public transit or pay a monthly to pay a monthly or yearly fee. I think this is something known as value capture. Is, is this something that's actually happening or has it yet to uh, be realized? Uh, Mayor McGee, how about in Lynn? Uh, I think it's a, it's a great question. I just, I think Veronica, uh, you know, really great points, Veronica. I think the discussion, I, I, just to follow back on that. Sure. Is, uh, how do we get the how do we get the money into the system? You know, is it is it you know substantially reduced fares? So I think that's a really important discussion to have. Value capture is a piece of it. So how do we fund the system? So there's a number of ways. I think value capture is a piece of the puzzle. Uh, I know Chairman Strauss, the House Chair, has been advocating strongly for value capture as part of our uh, funding mechanisms. I think we need to need to look at a broad range of funding investments and, and uh, uh, how do we do that? And, and you know, so I, I'm not. I'm not. I don't necessarily disagree with Veronica in terms of a small amount of fees for uh, for all, for for paying for the system. But I think we need to have a broader range. That's really been the challenge. How do we fund uh, what we need to do and create this vision we're talking about? I think the, the better city, but, but I think we have to look at the broader picture. A better city put out a, a report a couple of years ago that it's about we spend about two billion dollars a year on the MBTA for all modes of service. Um, and we get about $13 billion in return on the economy for that investment. So if we're talking about where do we find the dollars, whether it be lower fares, uh, value capture, you know, maybe, a, 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 you know, I've talked about a, a more um, fair tolling system in the region that money goes to all modes of transit, transportation, and, you know, roads as well. So I think we have a, we need to have that broader discussion about where the money comes from, but recognizing that that investment or those dollars create a major opportunity for economic growth, job growth, and, 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 and uh, the kind of uh, investment that we'll see in the private sector in this region. So uh, sometimes we lose sight of what we're talking about. Oh, there's a vision, you can't make it happen. I, I don't believe that. I think we need to have a, 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 an honest, open discussion about what should fears be? How do we get the dollars into the system? And how do we make it work? And then we create the kind of return that, that merits those, those uh, costs that we're paying. Absolutely, and I, I think it's uh, you know building on what Mayor McGee said. It's it's about setting that it's about setting that vision, and and you know to the uh, you know to the the um, the participant who asked that question about development. I, yeah, uh, you know right now, unfortunately, there's not you know tools like value capture haven't been passed yet. But in a lot of cities, um, you know they make putting money into into some kind of transportation mitigation or figuring out parking a a, a condition of getting that building permitted and going. And so putting on my housing uh, advocate hat. You know, I think that's one where, you know, 
participants can get involved and can be pushing uh, the developer in the city to say, wait a minute, that's too much parking uh, in this in this building. We have too much congestion as it is already, and we've got this transit service. You know, can we have that? Can we have that developer do exactly what they're talking about um, in in buying the residents, um, you know, T passes uh, and putting money in to help subsidize service? So I think that's that's got to be a part of it too. Is that we have to, you know not only re-envision how we get money into the T, uh, but re-envision how we move about and, and, and think about the fact that no matter what's powering vehicles, you know, we need to have fewer of them on the road um, and we need to have a vision of mobility um, that, that, that really prioritizes walking, cycling and transit service because those are the things that are gonna keep us healthier, that are gonna allow us to build more affordable housing, use our space better, protect rural communities um, and keep our air cleaner. Well, it's really getting into the, the meat of the conversation. As someone who's worked in uh, the affordable housing world a lot, my concern with value capture has always been um, if you make the development more expensive near transit, then you're basically trying to maximize the value uh, of what you can get there, which is goes counter to keeping areas affordable around transit. So that you really need to be con you know, conscious of that because we want to make sure we're not displacing the people who are most dependent on transit from the areas adjacent to transit. So, you know, that's, it's not a, it's not a perfect solution. We have to figure that out. And Veronica, your point about the free fare is also very, very interesting. I mean, here in Massachusetts, do, having done a little bit of research around the, the free fare issue, I've been shocked at how really inexpensive um, it is to have free, buses, uh, especially outside of the MBTA and other parts of the state. So if, uh, you know, there was a, a pilot in the city of Lawrence that for two years took its three busiest, uh, uh, three busiest bus routes, and it only cost uh, $225,000 to make those three bus routes free for two years. Uh, and, and in central Massachusetts with the, in greater Worcester, there's uh, the estimate for making all of its buses free is about three million dollars a year, which seems like eminently doable. Um, you know, the MBTA gets a higher percentage of its revenue from fares, so it seems like a, a low fare proposal there may make more sense. But you know, there was one Governor Baker just vetoed it actually out of a transportation bill recently. So I don't know if you can speak to that. You know, any of those issues. I think it's 60 million would be for both the RTAs and for the MBTA buses. So when you think about the whole grand scheme of the T getting $600 million out of fares every year and only 30 million of that coming from uh, local buses uh, and 30 million for the whole rest of the state, you know, it's, 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 it's an attractive, it's an attractive bargain. Uh, I wanted to ask about, I'm not sure which bond bill or bill it was in, you know, the provision that uh, MBTA communities must have uh, a zoning provision to, a, a, to uh, build affordable housing near transit stops. Uh, I'm not sure if it was mandatory, but if, if towns or communities didn't accept it, they wouldn't get certain state funding. Uh, and I understand the Middleborough Planning Board, by a vote of three to two, decided they did not want an MBTA stop in Middleborough because they did not want multifamily housing near the well, station. Before we, before we jump into that, because that's, I think that's a rich conversation, but I know Veronica was going to say something. Oh, about I'm the, sorry, the Veronica. Go right ahead. <laughs> that's okay, Bob. Thank you, Andre. Uh, to the point that you made about um, the relatively lower cost of providing free fares. I think this could work well for systems that have sustainable and reliable and dedicated funding sources to support those systems. Many transit systems are um, reliant on annual appropriations from the state legislature during budget season. That is a disastrous formula for sustainability over time. The systems where this I think could thrive is systems that are drawing on a variety of, of sources to support operations. Um, so, you know, I, I think that it is incredibly important to keep that particular um, notion at the forefront because so many systems are already struggling and having their hands out for the state legislature, that kind of relationship doesn't necessarily beget well for improved and expanded service over time. 
So, and, and this is sort of what I, I've seen from systems across the country. Um, Andre, you also made a, a point about affordability uh, in housing around transit stations. And I think that's particularly important. And I think one way to do that is by reducing parking. In some developments, a parking space is $15,000 per space in that development. So as we're looking to concentrating um, different uh, inventory types of housing around transit to ensure that those individuals that are most reliant on transit systems can afford to live closest to them, that they're not necessarily just luxury rate. One way of doing that, and many developers have started to do this, is to reduce parking altogether. If you talk to um, a new generation of, of developers, particularly in some of the denser cities, many of them are happy to forgo the parking spaces. And in fact, my experience with one particular developer in the New York Metro actually built a development with parking spaces that over time could be converted into housing units because they anticipated that in 15 years, fewer people were going to need parking spaces. And they did not want that to be dead money and dead space. So I thought that was very forward looking. And again, just um, an emergent idea for this new thinking of, of housing affordability near transit. Those are great points, Veronica. Uh, why don't we jump in here with the results of our third poll question before we continue. Uh, that was uh, whether or not people expected to resume your normal commuting patterns. 58% of you said yes, 22% no, and 20% still unsure. So interesting result. People still not quite sure what's going to happen. Those who uh, are returning think they're going to return. And you know, judging from the photograph in back of me, you see what we're concerned about. People returning to work, but not taking mass transit, taking to their cars, uh, either because of concerns about COVID-19 or simply cost. It could be cheaper for them, they think, to drive. But uh, one of our questioners said, what can we do to prevent this kind of thing from happening again, the congestion that we've been so uh, used to in the past? Any thoughts about that? You know, we need to look at at um, you know at, at congestion charging. I know it's 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 a it's a you know it's a dicey subject, and it took New York quite some time you know to get there. But I think there's a way uh, that you can do that with uh, with equity in mind, um, and and you know making sure that we're not harming uh, low income drivers. But we also do have to look at the at the facts, and and there's only about three to five only about three to five percent of people traveling on highways during rush hour are truly low income. Um, and so that's something we have to look at. And we also have to look at what's the cost of doing nothing, right? You know, there is a cost um, to, to, to mind numbing gridlock, right? You know, there are parents who have to pay extra um, to pick up their child from daycare because they're late. You know, there are people who miss family time. There are people who, you know, you know, not everybody is in, um, a, you know, a, a job like a lot of us where, you know, we, we just get a salary. There are folks who miss hours, um, um, or get to, or have to get to work way too early and then they don't get paid for that. So we have to look at congestion charging. We need to look at VMT as the gas tax becomes less and less of a resource, um, to help fund our roads. We've got to look at VMT and I think that will have an impact on, on, on how much uh, folks drive. And, you know, with all of these things, we have to make sure that we're providing enough transit so that, so that, so that this is a, so that this does not become a, a, a burden. But again, we can't run away from the conversation because it's, because it's a little bit scary. Because again, the status quo is costing people millions of dollars uh, a year. And like someone said before, they're already seeing the traffic return, right? So what can we do? Veronica, did you want to say something? And Mayor McGee chime in too. Thank you. Just briefly, as a veteran of congestion pricing in New York City from 2007 to when it was passed in 2019, I will say um, very strongly to Jared's point in agreement that it can be progressive policy. And you have to make that case that it's not regressive, particularly if you are taking the revenue from these congestion charges and reinvesting it into your public transit systems and your walking and your biking infrastructure. That is when it becomes progressive policy. And cities such as New York are saying, you've just touched on this, Bob, that there's a resurgence of traffic. In fact, New York City is now reporting 90% uh, traffic volumes, um, you know, of pre-pandemic pre volumes. And then in states like Delaware, we're seeing the same, which is actually celebrated because those fees support public transit. So it's, 
it's it's not a good cycle there in many cities. But I think um, you know we have to find ways of um, disconnecting the association between um, not wanting to reduce vehicular traffic because we want the revenues there, right? Um, and making sure that we're having we're supporting sustainable modes of transit. In many states, they're so inextricably linked that it, it's almost um, difficult to say we want to reduce vehicular traffic, but then that revenue supporting public transit, for example. So um, when you have congestion pricing schemes and others, you're really tying those benefits in um, and in a way that's incredibly progressive. And I think that argument has to be made very strongly and soundly. And Mayor McGee, what about preventing uh, the kind of congestion you see behind me? I think two pieces. Uh, uh, I agree with uh, Jared and Veronica in terms of we need to find a way to, um, you know, with, you know, with, you know, we're talking about vehicle miles traveled or whatever. I think that's uh, at this point, we're not at that point, but in Massachusetts, I, I, I proposed when I was in the legislature of Metropolitan Transportation Network that would have created fear uh, tolling throughout the region uh, with the, the dollars going into every mode of transportation, including roads and bridges, transit. And, and, you know, right now it's a really unfair tolled system. It's east west and it's from the north. But if you, if you created this system and you put a reasonable and fair tolling throughout the region, it would get a substantial amount of dollars to create a revenue source to then have the bonding capacity to make some investments. And, you know, as, as we look at the T for the state of good repair, uh, roads and bridges are in the same place. State of good repair is six, seven billion dollars. Uh, across the board. So we need to invest in a whole range of transportation needs. So that I think the fair way to do it is to create a more broad tolling uh, system in the in the region. So that's not just some commuters, but all commuters are paying for it. But those dollars are going in to make the commute easier over time, make transit more available and, and create a broad range of trans mass transit options. And, and going back to the beginning, don't cut service, keep the service, keep it available, work to improve it so that people uh, can start moving towards transit as these, as we know that, and I really believe the traffic is coming back and it will be back and it'll be the same gridlock we faced um, a year and a half ago. As okay. we're nearing- Go ahead, Andre. Well, Bob, I know we're gonna be nearing the end. So I just wanna call out a couple of questions that, that from the audience members that as you're thinking about your uh, last comments in these uh, few minutes, uh, you might be able to address. So one is uh, from folks are on, are watching this from outside the Boston area, you know, from the western part of the state or the central part of the state, you know, what can we say to folks? What's the future of, of transportation in in those areas? Uh, and then, you know, secondly, um, what is? Let me see if I. Oh, there we go. What is the? Uh, how can we get involved in in promoting this uh, transformation of our transportation system? And that might be something, Jared, you can talk about specifically. Uh, I personally think there's a lot of support for the rail vision. I don't think that's the question. The question is how to pay for it. And uh, I think a general uh, kind of question that I had, we've all talked about how the federal money is keeping the systems going. We have a new administration, but at some point, is that spigot going to be turned off? And when it is turned off, that's when it's really going to be difficult. And that's when the pressure is really going to be on to how to make these things happen. So I'd like your thoughts about you know, the end of, let's not assume that federal funding, although it might be substantially increased and maintained over the years, what if it isn't? What are we going to do then about our transit system? I think we're 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 lucky in that you know TCI is is looking like it's moving ahead, and that's for those who don't know that's a that's going to be a, a new funding uh, source that that's going to um, you know that's basically sort of setting up a cap and trade system uh, at the source for fuel uh, and for for carbon emitting fuels, and so I think that's going to produce you know a sizable amount of revenue, and then also we just have we we have to realize that transportation investments are exactly that. It's it's not you know it, when we're talking about building new transit lines, or whatever else, it's it's an investment. Um, so you're putting money into the future, and it's actually going to it's going to make you money in terms of the the, the train revenues, in terms of the 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 cost savings from accidents, from air quality. Um, you're putting people to work uh, and and putting money into people's paychecks. Are starting into people's pockets, which is then going to community. So you've really got to think about it 
that way. Uh, and to answer, you know, one of the questions around, um, you know, Western Mass and Central Mass. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know the future there is still is still transit. Obviously, it's going to be you know less so than in the in the metropolitan region. But I think something that's that is not often talked about that needs to be lifted up more is broadband access um, out in out in Western Mass, out in in rural communities in Central Mass. Um, and that is that's both a transportation issue, right? You know, you can't access some of these innovative new technologies that RTAs are trying to do or TNCs if you don't have good internet, uh, you know, good internet or good cellular connection out there. Uh, and there are things that can be done to, you know, not to totally eliminate, you know, we don't want to totally isolate um, rural communities, but there, there are everyday errands that can certainly be taken care of, um, you know, over the internet to, to lessen the reliance on vehicles if there's good broadband. Uh, but again, that doesn't mitigate, that doesn't uh, mean that we shouldn't be doing, like Mayor McGee said, doing what, you um, what Toronto is doing, what Virginia is doing, what Montreal and Quebec uh, are doing, and investing in a rail network that covers the entire region, uh, not just the folks in eastern Massachusetts. And Mayor McGee, what are your thoughts when that federal spigot is turned off? Uh, I think the I think I don't think the federal spigot will be turned off. It will probably be limited. Hopefully, in this administration, there will be a two or three trillion dollar infrastructure investment uh, across the board. But I think we, you know, we've been talking about this for a long time. The state needs to be part of this discussion, regional ballot initiatives. I think you talk to people, everybody accepts a vision, everybody wants a vision. How do we pay for it is always where the rubber meets the road. So I think we have to have frank discussions about how we do that in a fair way across the board and engage not only, you know, where we're talking about the greater Boston area, but I've always talked about, you know, outside the 490, 495 belt out to the western part of the state. They're as connected as, as we are in some respects. East-West rail is really something they're pushing South Coast rail. So if we look at, uh, you know, some uh, when I used to go to Boston, it could be days, it took me an hour and 20 minutes to drive nine miles. You put a rail, a, a 21st century rail system in, you can be from Springfield to Boston in an hour and 20 minutes. What would that do to transform our state? So we have to talk about a frank discussion about the investment we need to make, how we get it. But more importantly, it's an investment in our future and our economic opportunity that we can see from that, a real 21st century transportation system that works for everyone in the Commonwealth. We are small enough to make this happen. You know, Chicago would encompass almost all of, you know, from Plymouth to almost Newburyport, that's Chicago. We, we, we are a small state, we have an opportunity here if we're willing to take on this challenge and, and, and access the vision that will really be transformative for us. So it's, it's finding a way to, across the board, maybe value captures a piece, tolling, you know, uh, TNCs, you know, some of the, but find a way to, to, to put the dollars together and match it with federal dollars, regional ballot initiatives, and make those investments that will transform our Commonwealth. I think we can do it, uh, but it's not gonna be easy. And finally, Veronica, have you had a conversation with uh, Wilmington's most prominent resident about what the future may hold for transportation? Not directly, but fortunately, like many of us, I'm sure, know um, some very key individuals in his administration. I know Massachusetts has a very key leader in his administration at FHWA. Uh, I, I think, I don't think the spigot will run dry, but what I do think will happen is the federal fund, the federal government will expect states to step up more than they have. Um, the unfunded infrastructure price tag is well in excess of the $1.9 trillion that's being proposed by President Biden. It's probably in the tens of trillions of dollars. And there's just not enough money to spread around for these big projects. But what I think the federal government will do is widen the portfolio, but it's based set expect states to contribute more and with all the ideas we've talked about congestion pricing value capture other um innovative uh, strategies like ppps for toll roads and highways not necessarily for transit systems i want to be clear about that um but i think those states that prepare in their funding ask with uh, more skin in the game are going to be the most most successful moving forward 
Thank you, Veronica. And I should mention that uh, when we first were putting this together, Veronica said, oh, I don't know if I can contribute anything. I'm not from Boston. So as you can see, she certainly proved herself wrong this morning. Thank you so much, Veronica. Thank you, Jared Johnson, as always, very perceptive comments. Uh, Mayor McGee, always great to be able to hear from you about transportation. And Andre, welcome to the program. And uh, Thank thanks you. for being part of it this morning. Really, really great conversation. It. Thank you, Jared, Veronica, Mayor McGee. Really appreciate it. For having me. Wonderful. Thank you all. Thank you, Bob. It's great. It's great to uh, have this time to uh, to chat about these things. We want you to know that we're going to keep doing these, uh, hopefully monthly. So stay tuned. And also keep in mind that we have recorded this and we will be providing a link to the recording uh, thanks to the GBH Forum Network. Thanks always to Annie Scheffler and Lauren Joe. Uh, Alejandro to, uh, for producing this program this morning. We really appreciate their efforts. And thanks to everyone who's joined us this morning. Uh, happy traveling. Take care.